Are you good at keeping your finances in check? What would you do if you suddenly discovered you're missing money? And no, I don't mean just regular old pocket change. I'm talking about billions and billions of dollars mysteriously vanishing. And just how far would you go to make sure that no one finds out just how much you've lost? Today, we're going to be talking about what is probably one of the biggest accounting scandals and cover-ups to happen in this century. That's right, we're going to be talking about the WorldCom fraud of 2002, where an internal audit unit discovered that the company had over a whopping $3.8 billion worth of fraudulent balance sheets entries from the years 1999 to 2002. <sighs> Yikes. Who conspires to do such a thing? How exactly did they keep people from digging into the books much earlier? And what happened when they were discovered? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in this video today. So join me as we explore the 2002 WorldCom fraud. This is Business Explained. Let's get right to it. Just to refresh our memories, what exactly was WorldCom? WorldCom was a telecommunications company, and at its peak, it was the second largest long-distance telephone company in the United States, just behind AT&T. The company was the brainchild of Bernard Evers, its then-CEO, and three other investors. They cooked up their plan in a coffee shop, and soon, Long Distance Discount Services, Inc. was born. In 1985, Evers became the company's chief executive officer. Ten years later, in 1995, it had been able to acquire over 60 different telecommunication firms and it changed its name to WorldCom. Its rapid growth helped cement its position as one of America's leading telecommunication companies during that time. Its first major acquisition was in 1992, with its $720 million acquisition of Advanced Telecommunications Corporation. It even outbid its bigger competitors AT&T and Sprint Corporation, allowing it to have an edge in the telecommunications field. At the height of the dot-com bubble, the company was valued at $175 billion. In 1997, WorldCom and MCI Communications had a merger amounting to $37 billion, making the company MCI WorldCom. Now you might be wondering, this sounds like a pretty great story. Nowadays, the story of WorldCom is used to warn investors about getting into investments that seem too good to be true. How could they have suddenly fallen? What led to their demise? Let's take a closer look at how the scandal was uncovered. And now remember, if you want to learn more about schemes like these, learn more about all things money, get educated about how to do business, become business savvy, and enjoy more videos like these, subscribe to my channel and click on the notification bell, and may you be granted with many, many sweet returns. The WorldCom fraud is closely tied to the dot-com bubble, or the time that the stock equity valuations of the United States rose at a rapid rate. When the dot-com wave rolled in during the late 1990s, many people decided to invest in the tech market. However, it was one of the cases where the investment turned out too good to be true, and it turned into a bubble. When the bubble burst between 2001 and 2002, many businesses and individuals were negatively affected, with some even going bankrupt. The bursting of the bubble wiped out trillions of dollars worth of assets, and WorldCom was not safe from its repercussions. Ever heard of the term cooking the books? It's when finances or accountancy reports are doctored or manipulated by using accounting tricks to make them seem better than they really are. That's exactly what WorldCom did. The company attempted to fraudulently inflate their earnings as declared on their profit and loss statement, and it achieved this by manipulating key financial data. And guess what? Management was in on it. In fact, they even orchestrated the whole thing. WorldCom's chief financial officer used billions of dollars in operating expenses and spread them across property accounts, listing them down as a capital expense account. By doing this, WorldCom was able to show its investors that they were spending less and less as the years passed. Naturally, this wasn't the case, but investors were none the wiser. WorldCom was able to inflate its revenue by $3 billion, and they reported a $1.4 billion profit instead of reporting a loss. If they had told the truth and did not fudge their balances, the reports would have shown that WorldCom had lost money for the fiscal year of 2001 and the first quarter of 2002. So what happened? How were they discovered? Well, it was set off by a series of events. In December of 2000, a financial analyst by the name of Kim Amig was directed to make the labor for capital projects in WorldCom's network system divisions as an expense instead of declaring it as a capital project. 
Meg dug deeper and found that doing so would affect roughly $35 million in capital spending. Because of this, Meg thought that he was being coerced to commit fraud. Tax fraud, to be exact. He took it up to his superiors, and the command was scrapped. However, Meg was reprimanded and laid off soon after. In an interview in 2002 with Fort Worth Weekly, Mig admitted that he had been concerned about the company's spending habits for years. He had come from the MCI part of the 1997 merger, and he said that WorldCom was able to temper MCI's spending when the merger happened. However, that didn't stop him from encountering enormous billing statements from vendors. The resulting article was read by WorldCom's internal audit manager, Glenn Smith. This prompted him to report to the company's vice president, Cynthia Cooper, and they agreed to do some internal auditing, which they started on in May of that year. What they found was catastrophic. In April, CEO Bernard Evers was forced to step down. By June 2002, WorldCom confessed to everything. The company revealed roughly $4 billion worth of fraud, and on the 22nd of July 2002, WorldCom filed for bankruptcy. To this day, the company's bankruptcy filing is one of the largest in the history of the United States. After filing for bankruptcy, authorities took a closer look at the company's top executives, particularly Ebers and Scott Sullivan, the CFO. It turned out that Ebers had borrowed roughly $400 million from Bank of America to margin calls, and he used his shares in the company as collateral. By 2005, he was convicted of securities fraud and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. He passed away in February of 2020 because of ill health. Since then, WorldCom has fallen under Verizon, but its story now serves as a cautionary tale for investors and telecom companies alike. What are your thoughts on the WorldCom scandal? What kind of policies do you think companies should implement to prevent this from happening? Let me know what you think and let's talk about it in the comment section below. I'll respond to all of you who comment within the first hour. If you enjoyed this video, you should check out my other video called the dot-com bubble. If you look at the course of history, you will see that it's chock full of trends that seem like good ideas at the time, but did not really pan out to be as pretty as people hoped it would be. The dot-com bubble is one of those trends. It was a period of time a few decades ago where investors began pouring money into internet-based companies. Unfortunately, while bubbles seem magical and fun at the beginning, they are fleeting. Bubbles burst. Check out the dot-com bubble to learn what happened. Stay tuned, stay educated.